Praise God, we're ready to do another session on the gospel of the kingdom. And this one we're going to do deals with the subject of the bride of Christ. And the bride of Christ is a, is a subject that needs some clarification. I mean, for, for years I heard that the, the body and the bride of Christ were synonymous terms and that, um, that they, if you were in the body, that you were automatically the bride of Christ. But what we're going to see in this session here is that the bride of Christ is the one that receives the reward of the inheritance. And that the bride of Christ will be the one that will reign on Jesus' side in the millennial kingdom. You know, before we get into this, maybe I'll introduce a little something here. Um, I have in the class here is my good friend Dan Stock, where Dan and a good friend of mine, Bob Wadsworth, co-authored a book on um, the Word of God written in the heavens. And there's uh, the two constellations in the heavens that tells the reign of the king and his bride, the king, is Cephas and the queen is Cassiopeia. And they're right next to each other in the heavens. And it's the Word of God written in the heavens and the study of God's Word written in the stars is an absolutely fantastic study in God's Word. I've got a, tape, a set of tapes I've done on it, how to read and interpret the Word of God written in the stars. And it's, this is not New Age uh, astrology. This is biblical astronomy. Yeah, Charles has got it right here. And, uh, but this is, this is portrayed in the heavens, the bride of Christ reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ, the King. And so it really, in essence, now, because I talked about this last night, Jesus as being the King of heaven, right? The King from heaven. Then in reality, the bride will be the Queen of heaven. But the devil, in an attempt to cloak the truths of the, of the bride of Christ, and a counterfeit kingdom on this world has, has then fronted and promoted the queen of heaven as counterfeit worship. But the true queen of heaven will be the bride when she reigns with Jesus. But this gives a, an understanding about how to read and interpret the word of God written in the heavens. It's another subject for a different day, but it's a great subject. And uh, you may want to look into it sometime. But uh, um, the two constellations in the heavens that, that show this, uh, are quite prominent and in prominent places in the heavens as well. And usually they're, they're visible most all night long in the northern hemisphere, aren't they, Dan? You know, they, they stay up because they're very close to uh, Polaris, the, the North Star. But anyway, they're visible the entire time. And there's a place that is yet to be fulfilled in history for someone to reign with Jesus, understanding that when Jesus came to earth the first time during his sufferings, he did not take a wife. Now, contrary to the belief of Knights Templar, and Knights Templar are the ones that believe that Jesus didn't really die. He was drugged on the cross. They took him down. Then Mary Magdalene took him to Spain, and they had a child, and it was a girl, and she's the lineage of all of the royalty in Spain. That's a bunch of hogwash. Mm. Jesus Christ died and was raised from the dead. And, uh, but he did not take a wife. Mary Magdalene was not his wife, nor was Mary the mother of Martha and Lazarus, his girlfriend. Jesus didn't take a wife because he has been promised a bride in the coming millennium a, a, to reign with him on the earth. And that's just what this subject is all about, the bride and the body. Now, I want to tell you something very simply that you can understand this whole concept. And in, and in, and in looking at this, the whole aspect of this millennial kingdom will unfold to you. Now here's the statement. Are you ready? The bride of Christ comes out of the body of Christ the way the bride of Adam came out of the body of Adam. See, we've, we've used bride and body synonymously, and we said, well, if you're in the body, you're the bride. No, not necessarily. I said the bride of Christ comes out of the body of Christ the way the bride of Adam came out of the body of Adam. Now to show you this, I want to take you to the Word of God and show you the correspondence between verses of Scripture in the book of Ephesians and verses of Scripture in the book of Genesis. But before I go there, I want to show you this. Ephesians chapter 5 
gives probably the best teaching on the relationship between husband and wife that is in the New Testament. Granted? Amen? Okay, it, it does. Anyway, um, in this Ephesians chapter 5, you see verse 31, it says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And this talks, this is a direct quotation out of Genesis chapter 2, which we're going to look at in just a moment. But before we do, let me show you something in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. And it's absolutely magnificent. You don't see it in the King James and in the English, but I'm going to show it to you in the Greek. Here it says, For we are members of His body. Now, if we're members of His body, uh, then it says, Out of His flesh and out of His bones. Now, this is an interesting use of words because flesh and bone is what Jesus was in His glorified body, not flesh and blood. Because remember he said to Thomas, reach hither and put your finger into my hand and into my side. Uh, for I am not a spirit, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone. See, Jesus didn't have any blood. What gave him life was the spirit. So this is a clue to us that, this, that whatever he's talking about here reveals and deals with his glorified body. And that will be given to those individuals who reign with him. But I want to show you something that you can only see in the Greek text. This word of right here, for we are members of his body. This is in the genitive case, if you care. But these over here, they're actual prepositions for these words here, these of. And they are the Greek word ek. I'll show this to you in the Greek text here. So here's the word right here, ek. See, and here it is again, ek. E K, so this is out of his his flesh, and out uh, out of his flesh, and out of his bone, wherever that is, his bones. I guess is how it is. Anyway, this word ek means coming out from, and. If you'll notice in the earlier part of this verse, it says we're members of his body. There's no ek up there because it's just we're members of his body. But when it says of his flesh and of his bones, it says coming out of his flesh, ek, and out of his bones, ek. Out from among his flesh and out from among his bones. And this is an absolute categorical assertion without a shadow of a doubt that this is referencing the same concept as Eve coming out of Adam. Because where did she come out from? God opened up his flesh and took out of his bone and made woman. And the bride of Christ will come out of the body of Christ the way the bride of Adam came out of the body of Adam. Look at this. Amazing. Amazing. So I want to take you in here and uh, put these verses up next to them, to each other, so you can see the correspondence. Just give me a minute to do my jump through my hoops here, and I'll get this set up for you so you can see these verses. <coughs> this computer, a nice toy to have. Praise God. Now, let's go to Genesis chapter 2. And it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs... And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he woman, and he brought her unto man. Now, you see, when it says here, and the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, this is a profile of Jesus dying and being gone for 2,000 years and being asleep and being out of the picture when the bride is chosen. Understand? Adam, Adam was asleep. Jesus is in the heavens. And his body, however, like Adam's body was out and, and not cognizant or not conscious, but then out of it is when God made Eve. This is a profile to show that the bride will be chosen while Jesus is asleep or off the earth. Understand? So then it says, and he slept 
and he took one of the ribs. I don't... Uh, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. I'm, I'm back in Genesis 2.21 over here. But you see the bone? See the bone? And you see the flesh? You see the bone? And you see the flesh? And you see how they're members of the body? And so Adam slept, and um, how it was taken out of, and he took one of the ribs, and he closed up the flesh thereof. Then it says, and the rib which the Lord God had taken for a man, he made woman and brought her unto man. And Adam said, This is now what? Bone. Of my? Bone. And what? Blood. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Watch this. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one what? And then look at the corresponding verse in Ephesians 5.31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. I mean, look at the correspondence in the Word of God. Talk about profiles and hidden truths in the Word of God. How about that one? So, inequivocally, I don't, I don't really care to argue the point with anybody else if they want, as, it, as the Apostle Paul said, I'll exercise the same right. If any man wants to be ignorant, let him be ignorant. If you still want to make the body of Christ the bride of Christ, have at it. But I want to tell you, there is a choosing out of the body, and it will be the bride. And we're going to see this in other places in God's Word, too. And, and it's shown in other places. For example, when um, Abraham sent Eleazar, his servant, to find a wife for his son, Isaac. Now, this is a figure that Abraham's the father, Eleazar's the Holy Spirit, and Isaac is the son, Jesus. Understand? So the Father sends the Holy Spirit to find a bride for the Son. And that's, so whenever Abraham sent Eliezer, he said, go into Mesopotamia, that was the area that Abraham was from, and choose out of a selected group of people. So out of the selected group of people was where the bride came from. And the, the study of the bride of Christ is a, a fantastic study. There's a, there's a really neat book written on this. Uh, I think the name of it is The Bride of Christ. It's written by a man that I, I've spoken with uh, several times on the phone. He and I share some uh, commonalities in our belief about the bride. His name is Ed Chumney. And, um, but anyhow, that's a, a good reference point for this. And I was studying and knew this thing. And, and whenever I saw Eddie's book, and I called him up and we talked at length about it. And, it was, it's, and he sent, sent me his book and I've read it. It's, it's a really neat study. Anyway... It all says the same thing, and that is the bride of Christ is coming out of the body. And I'll show you this also when we get into this understanding in Matthew chapter 22, because I want you to understand this, that the bride of Christ is the one that's chosen out of the body, and there's a selection purpose, a selection process. And the selection process we're going to cover in the next segment of our class as this systematically builds bills in a preview of coming events. I want to talk to you about the judgment seat of Christ because the judgment seat of Christ is where that selection will be made. Where are there are members of the body that won't make it and there'll be members of the body that will and there'll be those that are selected out of it. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful truth in Ephesians 5 and Genesis chapter 2? I mean, I don't see, I think it's, I don't see how it could ever possibly be debated unless somebody's got a religious spirit which they do exist, but, uh, but not here. No. <laughs> so let me clean the slate here, then I will continue, and I'm going to go to <clears throat> Matthew chapter 22 and begin teaching there and show you one of the uh, most clear places in the Word of God on the teaching of the bride of Christ. Now, the reason, let me, let me again give you the understanding of what I'm talking about here. We, we've covered the two Gospels and the two inheritances, right? And the Gospel of grace gives us the new heavens and the new earth, and the Gospel of reward gives us the millennial kingdom. Now, what I'm showing you now is that this Gospel of reward of the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Jesus on the earth, will be given to those who are about the Father's business and those who labor in the kingdom. For, that, for you shall receive for the work that you've done. Therefore, what you do, do hardly as unto the Lord, not unto man, for we shall all receive the reward of the inheritance, for we serve the Lord Christ. This 
millennial reign is not just given on the basis of grace. This is good news for you, brother. I mean, you're a faithful man, praise God. You should expect to receive the reward of the inheritance, amen? And this is the same thing's true whenever Eliezer found Rebekah. When Eliezer found Rebekah, she was a beautiful woman, but she offered to water his camels. She was a working woman. Jesus wants a working bride. He doesn't want some lazy old hag that sleeps in at 10 o'clock in the morning and lounges around and drinks coffee and eats sweet rolls and watches soap operas. He wants a woman that's a working woman. Amen? And then when we get through to the end of this, I'm going to show you this, <clears throat> because the bride of Christ wears combat boots. <laughs> and not only so, the bride of Christ, after the marriage supper of the Lamb, will not, because she's, she'll be qualified by wearing the white wedding garment, then the white wedding garment is the same color as your uniform in the army. So the bride of Christ is a warring bride. Hallelujah. It's, if you're into war, you like this stuff, you'll love the millennial kingdom. It's going to be a real go-getting time. Praise God. Anyway, now to Matthew chapter 22. I'm going to go to Matthew 22, and then I'm going to take you to Revelation 19, and I'm going to show you the correspondence of how all these things work together, dealing with the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now see, this is the parable of the marriage feast. <clears throat> it says here in verse 1, And Jesus again spake unto them again by what? And said, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son. You know, I think I'm going to take the opportunity. I have a minute here. Let me show you something in Matthew chapter 13. And his disciples came to him in verse 10, Matthew 13, 10, and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Have you ever wondered why Jesus spoke in parables? I'm going to tell you why. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you, look at this, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of what? But to them it is not given. The parables are given so that we can understand the millennial kingdom. That's what the parables are about. And Jesus cloaked this from Israel because he knew that Israel was going to reject him. That's what I told you last night. And so he wrote there, or he spoke these in hidden code so that those people in the church and the bride of Christ would understand them. Brother, forget it. The people that are in the body that are not vying for and stri for the bride and, and striving for the masteries, they'll never understand the parables. They're too busy playing golf on Saturday morning or humming behind their jet ski. Come on now. Amen. And God bless you. I told you I honor you for your commitment. You're striving for the masteries. You're doing well. Keep up. Keep the faith, baby. Keep pushing, amen? But these parables are written to, to, because it is given for you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. The Jews didn't have a clue what Jesus was talking about. Of course, the, the, his disciples didn't either at that time, but now we can understand these now. So he again spoke to them by a parable showing them the kingdom of heaven. Got it? See, that didn't hurt. And now whenever you read the, when you read the parables in the Word of God, you'll know what they're about. Someone was telling me the other day that there's, what do you say, 38 parables in the, in the, in the Bible. Now, now don't quote me on the numbers here, but he said it, there's 38 parables and 22 of them deal with money. So I want to tell you something. You better steward your finances right if you want to make this kingdom. Are you paying your tithes? I said, are you paying your tithes? That's going to be one of the test questions at the judgment seat of Christ. You know, you can shuck and jive me. You don't like me? I don't care. But I would like to see you get in the kingdom. You don't like this confrontational question? Well, well, you have no right to question me. Yes, I do. Because I'm an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm a representation of him as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit's flowing through me, and I'm asking you, are you paying your tithes? Hello? If not, you're foolish. Because you can disqualify yourself from the kingdom. And don't look at me like you've got some sort of leg up on God. You're deceived. 
Now get with the program. Either that or just be willing to take the new heavens and the new earth and hang out in the outer darkness while the rest of us people that have decided we want to build the Father's kingdom and get about the business of building the kingdom on the earth did so with our monies while we were here, proved ourselves worthy. You can get in the outer darkness and whine and weep for all we care. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, where'd that anointing come from? <laughs> Amen. So that's the parables. Praise God. And God's very interested in how you deal with money. Anyway. He answered again, spake them by parables. You know what? Religious spirits hate it when I preach like that. It just, just drives them. They can't stand it. That's why I like to do it, because I don't like them. <laughs> <clears throat> Jesus answered and spake again by parables and saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Now this, this is the parable. The king is God, the father, and this is the kingdom of heaven. This is like the millennial kingdom. Got it? It's like God the Father, which made a marriage for His Son Jesus, and sent forth His servants, this is the Old Testament prophets, to call them, and this will reference Israel, I'll show you in a minute, call them that were bidden or called to the wedding, and they would not come. And so He sent forth other servants, saying, Hello, there's a wedding, guys, you're called. Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all the things are ready. Come on now, marriage is ready. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and the remnant of them, look at this, took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Mm -hmm. And this is talking about Israel that killed the prophets that was announcing the coming of Jesus. And primarily and, and fundamentally, the last one that they killed was John the Baptist. That's right. John the Baptist will be, in other parables, John the Baptist will be the friend of the bridegroom at the wedding. You know who John the Baptist is going to be? Best, best man. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. He deserves it. Because he came preaching the kingdom of heavens at hand. They chopped off his head for it. Mm -hmm. Took the remnant of the servants and treated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was angry and sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned their cities. And this has absolutely been fulfilled because in 70 A.D., the armies of the Roman Empire under the head of General Titus was sent into Rome and burned it to the ground. I mean, sent, sent into Jerusalem and burned it to the ground and leveled it and sent all of Israel scattered into the nations of the world as punishment for what they did to Jesus and rejecting the Messiah. Amen? And so then God has instituted the priesthood of the Gentiles, which we've already, start, we've already talked about. And when the fullness of the Gentiles has come, then the blindness is in parts that happened to Israel that Israel will again be able to see when the Gentiles and the Gentile priesthood leaves the planet at the gathering together of the church, then the 144,000 of the Jews will then again be allowed to be the priests of God on the earth and along with the two witnesses and the angels of God will bring about the great harvest during the, the great tribulation. Anyhow, but the, the priesthood of the, of, Jew, of the Jews right now is not in existence right now. It's neither, it's neither Jew nor Gentile but the church of God. Hallelujah. So any Jew that gets born again, he's in the church of God. So I say this to all you Messianic Jews that think you're better than everybody else. You're not better than everybody else. You're a church of God. Amen. Everybody's a church of God. Amen. So, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't be a respecter person. I'm going I'm to beat up religious spirits. I got to beat up on the Messianic Jewish religious spirit too. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> then said he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden or called were not worthy. Go you therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find bid or call to the marriage. So this is the New Testament prophets <coughs> and spokesmen. He said, go therefore, and, and as many as you find call to the marriage. So those servants went out to the highways and gathered together all as many as they found. Watch this, both what? Bad, Bad and good. And the wedding hall was furnished with guests. Now this is the age of the church and the Gentile priesthood to which we belong. So let me tell you something. Do not be surprised if there's a bad person sitting next to you in church. Mm 